You ever wonder what God's doing? Do you ever just look around the world and you think, what is going on? <laughs> Sadly, I do it a lot more often than I'm proud of. I look at the world and I think, what are you doing? And the next question that I ask is, why is it taking so long? <laughs> Am I the only one? I didn't think so. Yeah. Um, you also might be wondering why we just sang like veiled Easter songs on the last Sunday of September. You might not have done that. I did, did a little quick math right there. Easter is six months ago. And so I want to tell you some good news as we move into the fall. You know I don't like autumn. Like, that's, everybody is aware of that. Like, I don't, mm, summer is my thing. He's still risen. It's just a little reminder. As we look at the world and we see things that don't look the way we think they ought to be, and we see things coming to an end that we think ought to keep going, Jesus is still risen. Autumn is a time, this is called the normal part of the church, the liturgical calendar. We're, the next thing we have to get really excited about is Advent. So normal for a lot of us means boring, although some boring could be pretty good, actually. I could go for a little boring, but um, anyway, it's a season where it seems like there's not a whole lot going on. Autumn, by the way, has officially begun as of yesterday, and of course it began with the tropical storm as a nice way to usher in the new season, uh, nice to see some rain, that was good, uh, a little chillier, kind of nice. Uh, we are getting near, if it hasn't already begun, we are getting near the harvest time, and I know basically nothing about farming, except that in the fall things get harvested, in the spring things get planted, and in the fall things get harvested, and in the spring things begin, and in the autumn things end. And this year in particular, I've been thinking a lot about farmers, the life of farmers. In, in this area, the life of farmers has probably been a little tenuous this year, a little bit sketchy this year with the, the lack of rain that we have had. Um, I, I know farmers well enough to know that you put a whole lot of work in, if you, if you are a farmer that grows plants, you put a whole lot of work in early. You have to work the soil really hard while it's still cold, while it's still winter. You start working the soil, getting ready to plant, and then you plant really carefully. You get the very best seed that you possibly can, and you put it in the ground at the best time that you possibly can to set it up for success. In Virginia, I have no idea how you calculate that because we get all seven seasons in one day. See what I did there, seven. Yeah, we got them all, right? And some more. We have extra seasons here. I don't know how they ever calculate when to plant seeds in Virginia. And then there are other things I'm sure that you do to try to give the plants the best possible setup for success. But what if it doesn't rain? What if it rains too much? What if it rains at the wrong time? What if it's really windy? What if it's really stormy? What if there's pests? What if there's waves of, I don't know, mold? What do they deal with? Depends on, I guess it depends on the crop, right? Most of that, the farmer has zero control over. Or very little control over. And they just have to wait and hope and have faith. I guess it's occurring to me for the first time really how much faith it takes to be in the agricultural industry <laughs> because so much of it, you, you count on things that you cannot control. Isn't that life? If we stop and think about it, so much of life, we count on things that we cannot control and we plan for things that we have no control over whether or not we make them happen or not. They come or they don't. Things that we expect may not come. Things that we expect to not happen often happen. And we have no control. And so we look at the world that we live in and we think, why is this the way it is? Why is it so hard? Why is... <sighs> you know, God promised 
God made a lot of promises. <laughs> and we look at our lives and we look at the world and it would be easy to look at the world and think, what are you doing? What's taking so long? You know, if you rush to the end of the book, this book ends really well, by the way. But have you noticed, the closer you get to the end, the rockier it gets. <clears throat> it's just fact. I'm just setting you up for what we have to look forward to in the future. It just gets harder before everything gets wonderful. It shouldn't really surprise us about that. That things are going to be a little difficult at times. In the Old Testament, God promised Abraham a land for his descendants. He took him there, he let him live there, and he said, your people will be prosperous. Your offspring will be so many that they won't be able to be counted. They'll be like stars in the sky. They will be like sand on the shore. And your descendants will live in a good land and it will prosper. And their life will be good. After they are carried off to a foreign land and they are enslaved and they are treated poorly and beaten. Then I will bring them back and I will give them their land. And everything will be great. Well, everything, that all happened, right? It all happened exactly the way God foretold it to happen. And you would think when it happened, the people would see it and think, this is, this is exactly what God said was going to happen. Woohoo! Let's live in wonderful community with God forever in the promised land. Milk, honey, yay! This place rocks! And that's how that went, right? If you keep reading through the Old Testament, you'll recognize that the people forgot about God altogether. And so, <laughs> God reminded them by letting them get carried off to Babylon and live in exile away from their land for 70 years. So, I'm not saying that God gets our attention through calamity. I'm not saying that God causes calamity to happen so that we will pay attention to what he's doing. But I will step out on a limb and say that God will allow calamity to happen. He will withdraw his protection from calamity long enough to get our attention. I think that that's I think the Bible shows that pretty clearly in order to get us to focus back where we belong. And so, in the Old Testament, after the second time that they were carried away from the promised land, they were once, allowed, they were once again allowed to return. And when they arrived, they found their land had been pillaged, their fields had all been wrecked, their houses had been torn down, and the temple was completely destroyed. The great wonder that had been their life in the promised land was gone. And they had to be tempted to ask themselves, had God abandoned us? Have we so disobeyed God and drifted so far away from God that he finally just gave up on us and changed his mind? He would have had to have gone through their minds. Seeing the promised land as a disaster. And out of that, the Lord spoke to the prophet Haggai. Haggai in chapter 2, kind of an extended passage, but it sets us up. He says in Haggai chapter 2, starting in verse 1, on the, 20th, on the 21st day of the seventh month, the, Lord, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, ask them, who of you is left who saw the house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? Do you remember Zerubbabel? It's a great name for a puppy, Zerubbabel. Um, Zerubbabel's job, <laughs> Zerubbabel went back. He, he had been in, in Babylon, and he came back to the promised land, to Jerusalem, and he saw the mess, and he saw that all the, the people who had come back from exile and re-inhabited the land that had been given to them we're just living in it the way it was. Wrecked and destroyed. They were living in tents among the rubble that had been their houses. And they were just satisfied with that. Probably because they believed that the blessing of God was gone. 
They had blown it so bad that God had just said no. And so they were just content living in the ruins. And Zerubbabel went to them and he said, People, do you not remember the promises of God? God promised us this land. This is our land. Take it back. What are you doing? Why are you sitting around here living content with the world the way you see it? When God is with us, that's Zerubbabel, all right? Zerubbabel's a dude. I wish I had a nickname for him because that's a hard name. But anyway, he came in and he fixed their wagons. He got them excited. And part of that was because this word came to Haggai. Just when the people thought that all was lost, the Lord reminds them of his promise. Love that. If we go on to verse 4, he says, But now... This is the Lord. But now, be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. And work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I have covenanted with you when I, came, when I brought you out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. That must have been really good news for them in the place where they were living. Just as, the, as they had gotten to the place where they thought all was lost, the Lord reminds them of the promise that he made when he brought them out of Egypt, the promise that he had made to Abraham generations earlier. He assures them that he is still with them. He's not forgotten them, nor has he abandoned them. Because that's not what God does. God does not abandon his promises. God has never abandoned his promises. The promises of the past are still the promises of today. And thus, there is a certainty of his promises for tomorrow. It's good news. I've still been thinking, I spoke last week about, I've been thinking about the events of 9-11-2001, since we just passed that commemoration. And initially, there was a huge wave of people crying out, returning to God after that. I don't know if that was a sense of guilt or if that was a sense of fear or what it was, but you saw this wave of people calling out to God. And then that kind of waned. And it turned from people crying out to God for help and for courage and comfort to people crying out to God with questions, even blaming God. Asking questions like, where was God when this happened? How could a loving God allow something like this to happen? You remember? It shifted pretty quickly. And these are reasonable questions. <laughs> you know, for, for, human, for humans, when they're suffering, we want to know. And these are questions that came out of a heart of real pain. A sense of loss and mourning. And these are questions that probably, if we're honest, all of us have asked at one point or another when we have faced hard times. There is, I don't know if you've picked up on it or not, there is a prevalence of fear and uncertainty in the world right now. There is, uh, we live in a culture that is driven by fear. And uh, maybe, sadly, I was going to say even, but maybe especially even in the church, there is a sense of fear that drives us. And we seem to have forgotten that God is working among us from an eternal perspective. We get really hung up in what's happening right in front of us right now, and that's understandable. That's real. It's right in front of you. That's understandable. But God is looking at life from an eternal perspective. I, I, um, I get a devotion that's written by one of the pastors on the district every week. And he said something in this devotional that I thought was really, it's a visual that I think is really strong. He said, Jesus is walking around in your future. I like that picture. I think that helps us kind of get a handle on the present when we, that visual if we can just internalize it, that Jesus is walking around in our future. You notice what it said 
in Haggai, the first thing that God said, told the people to do, he said to be strong and courageous. He said three things, be strong and courageous. That's two different things. That may be mental fortitude. It may be physical fortitude. I'm not sure. But either way, he says be strong and courageous. Courageous is most definitely mental fortitude. And then he says the third thing, and work. Be strong, courageous, and get to work. There's definitely an element in the kingdom of God that he has set aside for humanity. There's definitely a task that he he gives us a part to play in the kingdom of God. He goes on to say, I am with you and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Be strong and work. God has promised to remain to his to remain true to his part of the covenant as long as we don't just sit there which is basically the reason that they had been exiled was because they were not taking up their part of the covenant so they got exiled because of that he says okay you're back i am with you now you have a part to play that's always been true there has always been a part for humanity to play in the kingdom of god so what are we to do What is our part of all of this? Well, we can look to the New Testament for that. And it gives us some insight into how it is that we can keep our vision in our minds of God with us, even when the world around us seems to be going completely out of control. Do you ever get the sense the world is going completely out of control, or is that just me? You look around a little bit, and people just nuts. Really. I mean, things just don't seem to be... Yeah, I, I do. I, I ask God often, how long, Lord, are you going to put up with these boneheads, knowing that I am one? But if you look at Hebrews, chapter 13, I think gives us some help here as to what he means when he says, be strong and work. Not that we're works-based, but there is a play that there's a part that we are expected to play here. Hebrews 13, 1 says, Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves are suffering. This, this is good. The actual translation says, remember those who are in bondage. Bondage could be anything, friends. Bondage could be fear. Bondage could be anxiety. Bondage could be some sort of addiction. So the first three pieces he gives us, remember to love one another. Don't forget to show hospitality to people you don't know. And continue to remember, minister unto people who are in bondage. Verse 4, marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. That is a direct quote from Deuteronomy 31.6, way back in the beginning. Which is interesting, he says that. You notice he talks about how we should treat marriage and the marriage relationship and keep that pure. And the next thing he says is, keep your lives free from the love of money. He uses the word, he says, be content with what you have. It's that part that he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We talked about that last week. The, The love of money separates us from our relationship with God. It gets in the way. He says, don't let that happen. I will never leave you. I will not forsake you. I understand. Remember he said the Father knows you need things. He understands we need things. But don't let them become a barrier between you and the Lord. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Verse 6. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? That is a quote from Psalm 118. Verse 7, remember your leaders who spoke to you the word, who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way, of their life, and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
Is that good news? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The hands that created everything that is in the world are the same hands that had nails run through them to pay for our sins are the same hands that guide us today through our struggles, which will be the same hands that will greet us into eternity. Is that good news? I hope you see it. <laughs> That's good news. <laughs> the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Verse 15, jump down with me. Through Jesus, therefore, we let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. This, lots of people quote Hebrews 13 verse 8, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, forever, and they like it. That's one that you'll find quoted, you know, cross-stitched on pillows and made in little pictures and little flowers, you know, everybody likes that one. It's easy to say. Is it hard to live with, though? Is it hard to remember when life is crashing down on you? When things are not looking the way you think they ought to be? When it doesn't look like you have enough to get through? When it doesn't seem like whatever the resistance you're facing is going to be surmountable? It's harder to live with it than it is to say it by leaps and bounds. When we live in a today that is so frightening and a tomorrow that is so uncertain, we spend so much mental energy lamenting what is gone from yesterday and bemoaning what is here today that we forget that Jesus is operating in eternity. Jesus has it all under control. We get so distracted by what we have to live through and what we're living in right now. We can't see eternally forever. That's something that humanity were limited. We can't see the, the ahead. We can't see tomorrow. We see what was and what is. And what was and what is, either good or bad, however good or bad that may be, is familiar. And sadly, we're comfortable with what is known. We're far more comfortable with what is known than what is unknown. Is that a safe statement that I can make? <laughs> we usually deal much better with what we know than what we do not know. And we can become very comfortable in our discontent rather than risk what we do not know and what we cannot control, an outcome that we cannot control. So we're blinded by the present and we can't even begin to grasp the reality of an eternal forever. So we're held in captivity in the now. I have some good news for you. Jesus isn't held in the captivity of the now. That's really good news. Jesus is walking around in the future. In your future. I don't know if that's absolutely true, but I know that Jesus has your future. And Jesus can do more for your future than you can even think about Jesus doing in your future. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He knows your yesterday. He knows what you've seen. He knows what you've done. He knows the things you're sad about because they're over. And he knows the things that you regret. He knows the things that hurt you in the past. He was there. He's there with you right now. Whatever is bothering you right now, whatever is weighing on you right now, whatever is, seems like you just can't get through it, He's there. And whatever you're worried about in the future, <clears throat> He's got that. Whatever you're wondering about, how's this going to go? He already knows. The most important thing is, He's going to be there for that too. You won't face it by yourself. And the one who actually can do something about it has promised to be there with you. 
God has promised all who trust Him and believe in Jesus will have Him for eternity. But not only that, He has promised us that that eternity, that forever, is going to be really good. Not just He's going to be with you, because I know we we run the risk of thinking, okay, well, Jesus was with me through all of this really crummy stuff. But it was still really crummy. So I can understand how people would say, well, that's great, but it's still going to be crummy because even if Jesus is there, no, the future that he has promised us, crumb free. The future that we have been promised for those who trust in and believe in Jesus is really good. Far better than anything you've ever seen, anything you've ever done, anything your mind could possibly conceive. It's so far beyond all of that. It's really good. And he's walking around in that. He's laying it out for you. The book of John says, I will go and I will prepare a place for you. And it will be good. That's a promise. That's part of the covenant. And then he says, I will come back for you. And then you will be where I am. The more I read about heaven, the sweeter it sounds. The more I learn about heaven, the less I like it here. (laughs) Sounds pretty okay. But what he said for us in the meantime, we still live with what God told Haggai way back at the end of the exile. It's like he's saying to us today, be strong, people of the land, be of good courage, and work. The promises of the past are still the promises of today and thus they give us a great certainty of the future. Nothing that could possibly happen has happened or ever even might happen has any power over God. Has any power over Jesus or does it have the power to break your relationship with Him? They have no power over Him so they have no power over us. You follow me? This is good. One day there will be no yesterdays. One day there won't even be today. Or tomorrow. Just forever. And I know for a lot of us that's that's hard to that's hard to deal with cuz we're kind of stuck in the timeline right now. But we won't be in that forever. We'll be in forever, forever. We won't have to deal with time forever. And for us, waiting for that may seem like forever. But compared to eternity, he tells us, Paul told this, our common suffering isn't worth comparing to the glory of what is yet to come in just a little while. We need to live looking forward to where our true home is while we do the work that he has for us to do here. Where the Father is, the Son is, the Holy Spirit is. The home that he has made for us is ready and waiting for us. Nothing in time or in this world has any power over any of that. That's forever. So how do we live with a forever mindset while we're stuck in the now? Well, my wife always tells me the theory's good, but what about the application? So I'm going to circle back around to the application a little bit as I wrap this up. <clears throat> Forever mindset. Be strong, be at work. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God's covenants that he made with Abraham, that he made with the exiles returning back like Zerubbabel, are still there. God's covenants don't have expiration dates. I love that. God's covenants do not expire. They're still in place, and he's still holding up his end of the deal. So we need to trust him and be about our end of the kingdom work. Because it's his desire that nobody would perish. It's his desire that everyone would come to a relationship, a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And he's entrusting us with that. 
So how do we do that? Well, he spelled it out in Hebrews. Let me break it down to smaller bits. He gave us this list of things, and I started with it. I'm going to end with it. Love one another as brothers and sisters. That's one. Show hospitality to strangers. That's two. Now, you have to ask the Lord what these mean, by the way, to you. Because to each one of us, God will give us a way to do these. He wouldn't tell us to do them if there wasn't a way to do it. And there's a specific people that we're supposed to do these to. He puts people in front of us to give us opportunities to practice. Okay? So, love one another. That means love Christians. Love your brothers and sisters in the world and in the local church right here in Verona. Love your brothers and sisters. Show hospitality to strangers. Remember those that are in bondage of many kinds. Breaks the heart of God that people are in bondage to things like anxiety and fear. And those things are what cause things like addiction. People aren't in bondage to addiction. Addictions are driven by things like fear and anxiety. Things that are directly from the devil. God doesn't want those things. And God will fix those things if we ask him to. And we trust him to. So that's three. Four, keep marriage, honor, honor marriage. I'll, just, I'll simplify that down just really simple. Honor marriage the way God intended. In all ways. Keep our lives free from the love of money. That's a big one. The Bible talks more about the love of money than it does about the love of people. It seems like maybe there's a problem there. There could be a bit of a tripping hazard there we need to watch out for. All right? Continually offer praise, which is a little hard for us sometimes. We're really good at offering praise when everything is awesome in our lives. But what about when everything really stinks? Or as they say in the King James, stinketh. They really do. It says that. What do we do? <laughs> are we so good at offering praise to Jesus when things are just not going well? We're not so good at that. We ought to be good at that. We're really good at crying out to God and asking for things in those times and praising Him when everything's really good. We really ought to flip that over. Praise God from whom all blessings flow even when they're not flowing. That's hard for us. But it's good because Jesus is already there. He will never leave you nor will He forsake you. That's what He promises. And the last thing he says is do good and share with others. It reads like a checklist of how to live in eternity even as we are held captive in now. Because that's the way the kingdom of God works. And there's no way, there's no reason that we cannot live like we're in the kingdom of God in the now. It will not change the way people react to you. Crummy things will still happen. For certain, things will still be hard. There are things happening that we don't like. People will do bad things to one another. People break the rules. People we love get sick, people die. That's life on this end. All of these things are happening for a little while. But remember, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Eternity is more powerful than the worst things that you could possibly face. Eternity has control. The one who holds eternity has control of all of these things. This week, as overwhelming things happen, and they will, this week there will be overwhelming things, there will be every week, overwhelming things will happen. I want you to think of these two words. All right? And I'm not saying this is not some kind of magic wand that will fix everything. All right? But as you face struggles, as you face difficulties, as you face questions, as you face the hard stuff, or as you notice the sunset, which in the autumn, those usually get really good. Okay? Or you see something really amazing happen. I was walking my dog this morning, and I noticed in the dead patches of my lawn, which is pretty much the whole three acres, 
you could see the new grass starting to poke up. That little bit of rain. There's new grass starting to work its way out of the, the dead ground. As you see stuff like that, as, as the Lord brings things like that to your attention this week, as awful as awful might be this week, or as amazing and transcendent as this week may be, I want you to think two words. Jesus forever. When you're facing something that you just don't know how you're going to get out of it, just think Jesus forever. All right? When you see something that's so beautiful you don't have any words, just say Jesus forever. Regrets about back then come into your mind? Jesus forever. Problems in the right now? Don't know where the money's coming from? Don't know how we're going to get through this? Don't know why that won't heal? Don't know whatever? Jesus forever. Some broken relationship that you just, you reach out and there's just totally cold stone wall in front of you? Jesus forever. Just try to keep, write it down somewhere obvious where you'll see it. Jesus forever. Put it on a sticky note on the dashboard. That's what I'm going to do. So it's right in front of me. Somebody cut you off in traffic. Before you can do anything, Jesus forever. Just get that as your natural response to whatever is happening around you. The hard things, the great things, the crummy things, the really exciting things. Headaches and heartaches. Those things will still be for a little while. But Jesus is forever the same yesterday, today, and forever. Knowing that is not going to change what happened in the past. It may not change what's happening right now. And it probably won't give you satisfactory answers about the future. It's probably not going to answer the practical questions you have about what is yet to come. But it will most definitely change the power that those things seem to have over you. Because those things have no power over you. And all of those things must bow before Jesus forever. Ultimately, they have no power whatsoever because Jesus is forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, whew. <laughs> when we stop and realize who you are and the power that you have and the fact that you love us and you want to be with us and you want a relationship with us, you want to live in us who you are, Lord. Help us. We, well, we can't possibly understand that. But help us to live with our eyes turned toward forever and not focused on the now or what was. But help us to remember, or even what will be, but help us to remember that you are God forever. And you are with us forever. And you are in us forever. And you are good forever. Lord, help us to praise you as you are worthy and live according to your way, according to your kingdom forever until we see your face, Lord. May we be about your business, focused on you, looking to you, listening for you, and living as you would have us live. Be glorified today, Lord, and forever. Amen. Let's stand together for our last song.